And welcome to a brand new series we're beginning today called The Big Three, Find What's Missing in Your Life. Uh, we're starting off this year with, with this idea that if we could only have three things in our lives to give us a sense of fulfillment, the three things we're going to be studying over the next three weeks would be those things. Now, if you've noticed this, um, I've found this in my own life, and perhaps you've experienced this as well, that it's, it's possible for our lives to be full but our souls to be empty. It's possible for our calendars to be full, our schedules to be full, our social engagements to be full. Um, it's possible for our work to be full, and I'm not sure if it's possible for our bank account to be really full, but, but it's possible to have kind of fullness in that area. It's possible for all of those things in our lives to be full physically, yet you know, we have this sense that something is missing. Though physically we have lots of fullness, uh, spiritually in our, in our soul we could have something that's, that's not there that should be. This is something I think a man named Abraham Maslow stumbled onto, this idea back in the 1940s, when he created this theory, if you're familiar with it, called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And if you're like I was in grade school, I remember studying about this, there was this pyramid, kind of this, this triangle type thing. And he said that the needs we have exist kind of at a base level, basic needs for physiological, you know, for food and for water. Um, then from there, we have these needs for protection and security. And you move on up and we have needs for connection and belonging, all the way up to what he called self-actualization. And whatever your view of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, what it demonstrates for us is that whatever your view of life is, all of us have to, at some point or another, acknowledge that we are dependent beings. We're not independent. We can't live life on our own. We're actually dependent upon other things for our survival. Now, we know and we accept that this is true physically. And when we go for a month or so without food, we starve. Uh, we go for a few days without sleep, our minds begin to self-destruct. Uh, we go for a few minutes without oxygen, and we die. So we get this, we sense this physically, the, the visible physical needs that we have, um, we, we see this, but what's true physically is also true spiritually. And the, kind of the premise of what we're going to be talking about in this series is that God has created us with souls. He's created us as spiritual people. And what we tend to do when we realize there's something missing Something that is kind of undetected and maybe unspoken. We can't even really put our finger on it. What's missing when we realize that, oftentimes what we do is we run to created things to try to satisfy this spiritual void. And what happens inevitably for every one of us is we end up causing ourselves more harm. We end up causing ourselves more misery. And over the next three weeks, we're going to look at these three things that I believe God has wired within us as needs. And when we understand what these needs are, and that these are needs that can only be met through God, it puts us on a path toward actually having a sense of fulfillment. It actually helps us to, to feel fulfilled in our soul and not feel as if there is an emptiness or a void. If you have your Bible this morning, if you would open up to Jeremiah chapter 2. What we're going to learn this morning and see is from this man, Jeremiah, who was a prophet of God. He was a man who had a really tough challenge in his ministry. He was called to prophesy before a time we know of as the exile. He was prophesying to a nation called Judah. Um, this was a nation who had already been through a lot, and he was essentially trying to warn them to turn back to God. Now, he was a guy who he was commanded not to marry. Uh, we believe he prophesied for some 40 years. And in all of that time, uh, some scholars, commentators will say he likely only had two converts, one of which was his scribe. And so Jeremiah is a man who had a very hard life, but God had given him hugely keen insight into the condition of our souls. And the things that he's going to address, the, the things that he's going to see about this nation, this group of people here, are the very same things that continue to pop up in our lives even today. So Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we see here Jeremiah recounting some of the history of Judah when he says this. 
He says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, so we understand from the beginning here, uh, Jeremiah is not speaking on his own authority. Um, he's, he's not saying, this is my best idea for how you can have a better life. He's not saying, this is my own intuition about how you can find fulfillment. He says, the Lord, the Lord is speaking to me from this place of authority. He says, verse 2, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth. So he's referring back to their past. He says, The love of your betrothals, your following after me in the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest. All who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. So he communicates to them, You've started off well, but something happened. Somewhere along the way, you began to try to search this emptiness, fill this emptiness through other things besides me. And what he shares with us here is what I want to share with you. That these are basically two reasons why the very first thing that we need is God. Two reasons why the, the ache and the emptiness that we sense at a soul level, even though our lives can be full... Two reasons why the very first thing that we need in our lives is God. The first reason he gives us, beginning in verse 5, is for our salvation. For our salvation. It's because our soul is sick with sin. Now we see the timelessness of sin here, beginning in verse 5. He says this, Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me? that they went far from me and walked after. I want you to notice this word. If you have an actual copy of your Bible, you might want to circle this, underline it. He says, and walked after emptiness and became, here, here's their destination. Here's where they ended up and became empty. And we're going to circle back to this idea as we walk through this passage. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of droughts and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt. It says, I brought you into the fruitful land to eat of its fruit and its good things, but you came and defiled my land, and my inheritance you made an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. And notice this, the rulers also, key word, transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. The indictment that the Lord gives to Jeremiah to share with the people is that they had turned away from him. And what it tells us, what it reveals to us is that we have this universal problem, this universal and timeless condition that our soul struggles with called sin. Now, it's here that it's interesting when we ask the question, why would a person need God? If you lean into uh, secularism and what's the most prevailing view within culture, what you'll tend to find is that, that God is a crutch. God is something that weak people need because they don't have the strength to handle life on their own. Um, there's one man named Richard Dawkins who wrote a book, The God Delusion, he makes a statement. He says it like this. He said, faith is the great cop-out. He says, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. So Richard Dawkins, Samuel Harris, others who, if you're familiar with the, the militant atheism movement, this idea that we should detach ourselves from belief in God if we're going to, to live under truth and reality basically says that, that God is really a figment of our imagination that we've created out of a weakness so that we could have a crutch. But there was another man who came along and had a very, I thought, interesting insight, a man named Stephen Asma. Um, he's a sociologist at uh, Columbia College, and he came along and countered this idea, uh, wrote a book, um, called Why We Need Religion, but he goes further and he makes this clarification. He says, I agree with them 
And that is Richard Dawkins, Samuel Hawkins, you know, these other, Sam Harris, these others who are militant atheists. He says, I agree with them that religion fails miserably at the bar of rational validity. So in other words, he says, religion is, is, is invalid as a belief system. He says there's no intellectual coherence to it. He goes on to say, but he says, but we're at the wrong bar. Religion is not necessarily meant to be true. It's meant to be useful. He says religion helps people, rightly or wrongly, manage their emotional lives. He says this, that the reduction of human suffering should be the standard by which we measure every religion. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, but the one thing I want to illustrate is this, that according to this thought, religion, and we would say God, is either A, a figment of our imagination that is a crutch, or God in this idea of religion is something that just helps us cope during bad times. It's not true, not valid, but what Jeremiah helps us to see is that religion, and we would look specifically through the lens of the New Testament, we would see Jesus is someone who has come not just to be a crutch for the weak. He has come to be the answer for the dead. And what this speaks to us is that we don't need a crutch. We need a cure. Opening against the idea that, uh, that God at his very best, might be a useful thought, but he's no more than that, we would look and say, no, 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 there's something deep within us that realizes our souls are sick with sin. Paul, he will tell us in his letter to the church in Rome, second chapter, 15th verse, that, that our consciences testify that the requirements of the law are written on our hearts. And unless we sear or harden our conscience, we are born with this hardwired understanding that something is not right with us. At a soul level, we need atonement. We need forgiveness. We need cleansing. And so we see here that Jesus has come in the, the larger picture of the New Testament, that he has come to free us from our sins, to save us from our sins. And that need that we have at a soul level can only be provided through Jesus. So the first reason we need God is because our souls are sick with sin. We need to be saved from our sin. The second reason we find that we need God is not just for our salvation, but secondly, we need God for our satisfaction. Because our soul is created for worship. If you begin in verse 9 of chapter 2, Jeremiah says, Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord. He goes on, he says, And with your sons I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Katim and see, and send to Kadar and observe closely. Uh, the modern day of saying, the modern way of saying this would be, you know, go to the east coast, go to the west coast, go throughout the land and observe and search and see if there has been a thing such as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Number two, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The picture he gives to us in verse 13, um, there would have been two ways the people could get water. One was through a spring, which would have been a source that the water was always fresh, it was always flowing, it was consistent, or through a cistern if the spring wasn't available. A cistern would have been basically digging out a big hole in the ground, somewhat like we would have as a pond, and covering that with a form of, of plaster. But eventually that plaster would crack, it would dry out, and the water that was in the cistern would drain away, leaving the people empty. Leaving the people yearning. 
leaving the people wanting something. And what verse 13 reveals to us is that if we forsake God, we will look for God in something else. If we forsake God, other things will occupy the place of God. But again, us being dependent creatures, we have an ache, a yearning, a thirst for something to fill us at a soul level. In the same way that we need physical food and water and nourishment, spiritually, our soul is created with these needs. And what it says to us is that we all, we all worship something. And if we turn away from worship of the true God, we will look to the created things to find a a replacement or a filler for that. Man, years ago, John Calvin said, paraphrase, he said, the human heart, it's like an idol factory. It's always creating and producing um, these idols. And we're all as hardwired with this this ache and this hunger for significance and security, for connection, for belonging. The only place we really find that is through God. Jim Carrey once said this, Jim Carrey, the famous actor, he said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Uh, The Rolling Stones, I can't get no (laughs) satisfaction. I love what C.S. Lewis said. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Augustine, our hearts are restless until we find the rest in thee. It's only a matter of time that we see another celebrity, another famous person, another Solomon reincarnated in this world who has everything that they can touch physically, everything that they desire they can consume, Chase and chase and chase and find that those things are empty. And so the question becomes this. What are your broken cisterns? What are the things that if you turn away from God, they may not be bad things in and of themselves, but you're looking to those things to provide something that God never intended for those things to provide. What are the things that have become idols? I want to share with you and help you as I, as I walk through these four common idols. And if you would, just do this as I talk about these. Just try to introspectively uh, pray and, and ask the Lord to guide you in seeing. Maybe you have one of these that's more prominent. Uh, perhaps it's the case that you'll see there are several of these that pop up in your life from time to time. But all of us, all of us, all of us worship something. All of us give ourselves to something. And all of us, at some point or another, will be tempted in one of these four directions. The first common idol for us to consider that may be present in your life is the idol of success and achievement. If if this is something that you turn to, If this is your broken sister, you'll tend to find your identity through your activity. You'll define who you are in terms of what you do. And so your your self-confidence, your self-worth will largely be tied to being ahead and winning and being perceived as successful. Um, If success and achievement are your idol, if this is your broken cistern, you'll use success as a means of distinguishing yourself. And if you distinguish yourself from others based upon your success, you'll be filled with pride because how much better you are than others. Or if you fail, you'll feel uh, the weight of shame and, and hopelessness because you haven't measured up to what you should be. 
You'll live on the treadmill, off again, on again, the treadmill of achievement, where you'll define how well you're doing in life based upon your last success or your last failure. One lady has said this. She says, all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting again and again. She says this, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's what's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. Those words were spoken by Madonna. And history is filled with, both throughout the ages as well as contemporary time, it is filled with people who, in the search for success and achievement, realize it is a broken cistern. And if success and achievement are for you, your broken cistern, hell on earth for you will be failure or losing or somebody else being a little bit better than you are at this thing. Heaven on earth will be victory, achieving, conquering, growing. And the the functional Savior that you'll turn to will be competing and winning. And the thing that you'll look to, to fill that ache, to fill that void, to fill that emptiness, will be being just a little bit better than the next person. So it could be that your broken cistern is success and achievement. The second very common idol, which is a broken cistern, is this. It is the idol of approval. Also referred to as the fear of man. If this is your broken cistern, how you feel about yourself will largely be determined by how you think other people feel about you. Say that one more time. How you feel about yourself will largely be determined by how you think other people feel about you. You'll be infected with the disease to please A people and their opinions of you will have a godlike power over you. So your contentment in life, your well-being in life, is largely dictated by what other people think of you. You can feel despair and crippled when somebody criticizes you or doesn't approve of you. One of the biggest tells of the idol of approval is when you practice impression management. Impression management is something that, if you want to learn how to do this, church people can be really good at doing this. Pastors can be really good at doing this. It's, it's when you try to control what other people think about you through monitoring what information you let them know about you. So, so you try to make sure that people have a certain opinion of you, and to get that certain opinion, you can't be really honest or transparent or vulnerable You have to always relate through the lens of appearance. And this is one of the uh, sins referred to in the Bible as the fear of man. And if approval for you is an idol, then your hell on earth is this. People don't like you. Someone thinks poorly of you. Uh, You are unloved. You may feel unappreciated. You may feel unknown. Heaven on earth for you is that when people look at you, they approve you, they see you, they applaud you, they recognize you, they give you the pat on the back that you feel you deserve. And the functional Savior to which you'll turn is performing. Is setting the true needs of your heart aside and and trying to become something that other people think you ought to become. And say it's very briefly... Some of you, you you may have been living out of this wound since the time you were a young child. And you never had the freedom as a child to be who you really were. 
And this may be something that even this day, you've got a parent who you are consciously, like always worried, what do they think or what do they say? You're, you're living out of this, this woundedness. And you need to say, that's a broken cistern. I'm not going to continue to find life from that. That's the second common idol. The third common idol is this. It's the idol of money and possessions. If this for you is a broken cistern, you'll tend to derive your worth through your wallet, through your, your bank account, through the stuff that you have. You may tend to choose money and the acquisition of material goods over people, over relationships, and over family. Uh, things for you can become a symbol of how important and meaningful you are. You may have a steady stream of worry and fret over your job or the economy or the stock market or your 401k. You may tend to compare yourself to someone who has a little more than you. And one of the most besetting sins in your heart will be envy. This idea that if I could just get a little bit more and a little bit more. And so you give yourself to acquiring Constantly checking on the status of your finances, constantly worrying about those things. If this for you is a broken cistern, hell on earth for you will be you don't have enough money to retire comfortably and live the way that you want. You, you may not have enough money to send your child to the college that you would want to send them to. It will be that you don't have enough money to, to buy the dream home that you've always wanted or to get the vehicle that's going to make you look and feel significant. If this is a broken cistern, hell on earth for you will be this. Heaven will be financial independence. I mean, this belief, if, if you could, has anybody ever thought this? I have. That if you could stack up enough dollar bills, whew, then you could just relax. Then you could finally take it easy, and then you wouldn't have to worry, and then you wouldn't have to stress. And the functional Savior to which you will turn is acquiring. Your heart is set toward that the plaster that you place inside of your cistern, the way that you try to preserve life is through getting more and more and more. And there's some of you, when you're 20, you thought, well, when I get older, I won't have to worry about that. But now you're in your 60s and your 70s and your 80s, and you're still thinking, how can I get a little more? It's acquisition that you give yourself to. And so it could be that this is a, a broken cistern. The third and final common idol that at times can affect all of us is the idol of pleasure and comfort. If this is your idol... You likely have a hard time controlling what you consume. You have an inability to order your life or restrain your desires and impulses. And so, so you're, in a lot of ways, you're dominated by your desire. And you keep doing the things that you know are going to lead to regret, but they feel good in the moment. So even though you know it's going to lead to self-loathing and shame and, and regret, you, you, you've stayed locked into that same pattern. If this is for you a broken cistern, you likely have a long string of broken promises and broken hearts. Of people you've made commitments to and you've broken the commitment. Of people who don't trust your word any longer because you just can't seem to master this area of your life. And you may feel as if, why do I keep doing the same thing again and again and again? Well, the root cause of this is spiritual. The root cause of this is you've forsaken God, the fountain of living waters. And you've looked to created things to, to give you life and to give you nourishment, to give you sustenance. So if this is for you a broken cistern, if it's an idol, your hell on earth will be this. It's to be without whatever substance, whatever drug, whatever food, whatever drink, whatever website, whatever it is that brings you that sense of comfort, that sense of pleasure. Heaven on earth will be this, is to have comfort and enjoyment, to have that high available at any time. And the functional Savior to which you're turning will be medication. 
It can come in many different forms, from food to drugs to, to any of those things that in and of themselves might not be bad, but they have a power over you that is God-like. And one social psychologist, it's always fascinating to me to see when people who, with a secular worldview, come to acknowledge what the scriptures have made clear for thousands of years. And then Dr. Heidi Halverson, she's a social psychologist, she says this, that people whose goals are all about image maintenance and financial gain tend to have far less happiness in their lives, even if they succeed in becoming rich and famous. She says, here are the goals that are not going to help you achieve lasting well-being. Becoming famous, seeking power over others, polishing your public image, obtaining other people's validation and approval, or accumulating wealth. What this passage boils down to is this central truth. Only God, only God can save us from our sin and satisfy us in our souls. The message of Jeremiah, if you dig deeper and, and kind of see what he was moving the people toward, he wanted them to see that, that this is a broken cistern. You've chased after something that is false, it's an illusion, it's a mirage, and he wants them to see it before they feel the consequences themselves. At some point, friends, the, the truth is all of us, we chase after, we go after something that is false that appears to be good. I remember one time I was at a theme park and I was following my dad along and it got to a point where I needed to get his attention and, and I ran up to him and, and tapped him and said, hey, dad, hey, dad. And, and he looked at me and it was then that I realized it was not my dad. And so he looked at me and I've been pursuing this image, following this image, because it looked like the real thing, only to find out later that it was false. And, and when that happened, it, one of two things I could have done, I could have removed that image from my life and said, I'm just going to kind of go on about my way and, and figure out life on my own. I could remove that false image, or I could replace it. I could turn away from that which was false and turn toward that which was true. I could turn away from that false father who really wasn't my dad and turn toward my true father. And as every kid intuitively understand, understands, when we, we want to replace something that is false, we, we don't just remove it, we replace it. And I believe the call that God gives us is this, that if, if we realize, and all of us do, have these idols that pop up from time to time. It's a lifelong battle. When we have these things pop up, we don't just turn away and say, I'm just going to remove that and repent of that and get rid of that. We say, yeah, I'm going I'm to remove that, but I'm going to replace it by turning toward the, the fountain, Jesus will say, of living water that actually does quench that actually does meet the deepest needs of our soul and so if you're at a place as you begin this year you sense an emptiness it's most likely because of one of two things you need salvation you realize your soul is sick with sin the answer to that sickness is jesus his death on the cross and receiving that free gift that he's given to us it's either because you need salvation or it could be because you need satisfaction. Because your soul is wired and created to worship. And what you need to do is to first say that, that these things that I'm turning to for meaning and significance and fulfillment, I, I may still have some of these things in my life, but they're not going to have this God-like influence over me. I'm not going to give them the power to make or break me. I'm going to turn from those broken cisterns. I'm going to turn toward my Father. I'm going to turn away from the false image, the false representation, the created thing, and I'm going to turn toward the true Father, the Creator Himself. Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for Your Word, and as we have opened it up together, we just pray. You meet us where we are. I thank You in advance for Your grace to us. 
that you see this pattern in Jeremiah has, has played out time and, and time again. Yet you, in your goodness, continue to invite us back for a fresh drink, for fresh nourishment. And Father, I pray that's what we find today as we launch into this new year. If we can recognize any of the false images, the broken cisterns, and just be honest about it. Just be honest with you and say, hey, this, this in my life, is, is the thing that I tend to turn to. But God, I don't want to do that anymore. So we pray for your spirit to guide us now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>